Welcome to the indie games industry, Ask Me Anything. I'm just going to do a quick intro. Our panelists today, we have Kevin Cole, a Boston-based indie game developer, and Jed Steen, a.k.a. Hackjack, an Idaho native and self-taught game developer. Enjoy. Hello. Hello. Hey, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Kevin. Do we have any questions to start? Anyone want to know anything about indie games? Oh, hi. Uh, I'm Kevin Cole. Uh, I, uh, I, I make games as part of a collective called Super Try Studios. We've been making games for about 11 years now. Um, I mostly do kind of short form games you can play in your browser, but we've also released things. Uh, we have a, we have a, a roguelike on Steam. Uh, we have a, uh, a tabletop RPG called Space Kings. Um, we make a lot of different stuff, and uh, we, we hope to do so for a very long time. And this is my friend Jed. Uh, hello, everyone. For anybody that just came into the room, uh, my name's Jed, better known as Hackjack Online. I make a lot of silly physics games. I made a big one called Guts and Glory. Um, and I worked on a big project called Pigeon Simulator. I also make a lot of silly little mini games, prototypes, and stuff like that. And very involved with the uh, gaming community. So always happy to help wherever I can. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I described uh, Super Try as a collective, uh, mostly because it's uh, uh, I can't employ anyone. I can't afford to, uh, and it's mostly just me and my friends making games. Uh, usually the setup goes something like uh, I'll bring in my friend Joe to do music because he's a great musician, and I, I, that's the one thing I don't really know how to do. And I might involve some of my other friends. My friend Hadley is a great writer, and uh, they uh, often contribute writing to stuff that's more narrative-focused for Super Try projects. And uh, I know a couple artists, so I'll kind of just take on the role of doing the rest. Uh, most of the time, I do solo dev stuff. So I'm, you know, I can cover like graphics and sound and, um, and programming and design and all that. But when, whenever I pull people in to work with me, we're, we're under the banner of Super Try. Yes. Um, I have a question. About, um, you know, Yeah, yeah. Um, for a parent of a young person, I'd say Roblox is one of the best ways you can get some real world experience out there because they have a really great community for supporting young creators and you can sell the games on there and everything and get experience with the business side of things and get direct feedback. Um, going beyond that and working on like Unity or Unreal games, other engines. I think the next best thing is uh, hobby groups. There's a lot of people that are online looking to start up a make their own game project, but maybe it's just a programmer and they're looking for an artist or vice versa. And they team up with some other people and they work together on a project as a hobby. Sometimes they continue to take it to the point where they sell it. Um, I knew another developer that started here in Idaho and he started a project that way. He focused on a very niche idea that they just all loved. It's called SCP Games, um, Secure, Contain, Protect. <laughs> um, it's this basic idea of like, there's aliens or there's monsters and you, you build a team and you go and try to find them. And that's just what they're into, him and his friends. So they started a hobby group together. Um, some of them were good at coding, some at art, some at music, and they, I think it was five or six of them, worked together uh, just as a passion project passion project turned into a real project and um, next thing they knew they had a million dollar company and they're they're living in a different state now and stuff um, 
again, it's not all about the money, but that's how things can take off and turn into real businesses. And then one final thing too can be college courses. Um, there's the number one one that I'd recommend is called DigiPen. Uh, it's a Nintendo, it's really tied to Nintendo. And that's like the best game development program I've ever seen for games. Um, other ones, do your research. Uh, they're what, you get out of them what you put into them, really, when it comes to college. So um, I've seen people come out of the local BSU one with no clue and some with you know some pretty good skills. It really just depends on what, what you put into it and how good of an of a instructor you have. Any other questions? Yeah, back there. You're, you're you're the 3D guy. I'm the 2D guy. <laughs> okay, I can answer this one. Um, so another term for that is XR too. Um, so XR games treat them like mobile games. Mobile games, you're not gonna find success unless you're in like that top 10 percent, and or you find a really good niche. Um, so VR is like the same, but much 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 smaller. So you, it's even more important that you're in that top part or you have a good niche. So. The most lucrative things that you can do in that space right now are B2B. So if you're making, you know, um, there's another booth here called Intracon. They're making stuff for HP, stuff like that. That's the most lucrative thing you could do and have that as your your money maker, your breadwinner, right? And then you can make games on the side until you find your hit. Um, another way is to start off with a strong IP and jump into something already well known. Um, but it's got to have a good crossover with that particular community. So if you're dealing with a lot of early adopters, a lot of like, you know, hardcore nerds like myself. Um, it's not, you know, quite mass market type of thing yet. So, yep. Uh, find find a test group. Like get it in people's hands. Uh, like I said, demo or die. <laughs> you need to demonstrate it. You need to see if what you have is worth uh, people's time and attention and money. So the sooner you get in people's hands, the sooner you know, and then they'll they'll do the marketing for you. It's a small community. So if you have something awesome, that's the nice part. If you have something great, everybody in the VR community will know about it super fast. You just have to have something really great, and it's you have to get those people's attention to test it. Those are like the, the Steam Next Fests, right? Like that's sort of the big uh, uh, demo sharing kind of thing that Steam's been doing. It's been working out pretty good for a lot of devs. For a while, the industry wisdom was, I believe, to not do demos, but demos seem to be back in a big way. I think they're pretty good for like consumers to figure out like whether or not they like the game or not. But it's also a neat sort of insight into you know the process of making a game when you release an early version as a demo. So uh, yeah, just uh, I think always like... Um, Pulling people in, like play testing, checking, like that's always that, that's good advice for whatever platform you're uh, re releasing a game on. Any other questions? Um, a personal favorite mechanic or trope that I like adding to video games. Uh, I. I'm trying to remember all the games I make and just, and see if there are any commonalities. Um, I, I think in general, I tend to cling to stuff that is uh, uh, movement based. Like I really like, um, I really like doing precision platformer type stuff right now. And uh, I kind of find every time I'm like putting a game idea together, I'd be like, you know, it'd be really fun is if you could do a double jump and that kind of, <laughs> That, you know, that, that's the kind of big ideas that <laughs> the games industry needs is more double jumps and platformers. But uh, I, I, I kind of, when I put a game together, I kind of tend to think about whether it's, uh, is, is what, what's the main joy being taken away? Is it like I'm, I'm beating the odds, I'm like uh, analyzing risk and making the best possible decisions? Like that's kind of how I look at my roguelikes. Or is it more about the joy of movement and mastery over controls? Uh, 
I'm I'm not sure if I answer the question. I feel like I'm rambling. But Jed, do you have any favorite mechanics? Et cetera, yeah, et cetera? mine's pretty obvious. It's physics. I love physics stuff. Um, there's just so much room to play with in that space and make diff- different things. You can take a game like Paperboy, and that's completely non-physics. Once you add physics to riding a bike or trying to balance it or land jumps, it becomes a whole different thing. So I really love that. But I take a two approach to designing games. Um, when you're playing a game, there's two different main mechanics that lead to fun. It's intrinsic mechanics and extrinsic mechanics. So intrinsic is um, I play with the ball because it's fun, right? Bouncing it off a wall, throwing it through a hoop, whatever. You're just playing with it purely for the joy of playing with the thing. So you can start a game design from that point of view and make something intrinsically fun to toy around with. And, and at that point, it's just a toy. It's just something you're goofing around with. And then you add some rules and some limitations to it and some rewards, then you have an extrinsic mechanics. So once you add those to it, then you can give it give new rewards to the player where it's beyond you know just bouncing a ball for the joy of bouncing the ball. Now you're throwing it from a hoop through a hoop for points. You're competing against another team, and then there's this competition level involved, and now you have a different type of reward. So you can take either approach and start from those, but I really like taking the intrinsic approach, and that's why I like physics, is I just say, hey, is bouncing this ball fun? Is just riding this bike fun? Make that fun first by itself, and then I'll build some rules around it and turn it into a game. Yeah, you can kind of see that uh, development style in stuff like uh, uh, Tears of the Kingdom and stuff like that, where you have kind of this nebulous, like, um, you know, uh, vehicle building mechanic, uh, and they keep trying to find reasons for you to interact with it. Um, but like that idea of intrinsic fun, finding out just like how, how can you have fun in an empty room and then figuring out how to, uh, always like direct your players toward that most fun experience is, yeah. is a really good development process. Yeah. Look at the developer Shigeru Miyamoto, the guy that made Mario. Um, when they made Super Mario 64, they spent the, a huge chunk of the development time basically in the, in the empty room, they had that beginning space with the, the castle and stuff. And um, they just wanted to make running and jumping and playing around in that space intrinsically fun. Before they worried about any of the rules, they just said, make that fun. And that is actually exactly what I'm doing right now in my Game Jam project. I haven't made any levels yet. I just have an empty room with a couple of blocks. And I'm just trying to nail down that feel of like jumping and falling and uh, running and uh, just the, 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 the things that the players are going to be interacting with the most, if I can make it fun in a blank room, then the level design is just going to direct that fun to be like the best of all possible worlds. So, yeah, cool. Yeah. So, something you kind of talked about was that when you, build, when you start a game, you have a lot of different ideas, right? So, what's your method for narrowing down those ideas to what works best and what's going to be worth putting your time into versus what you should cut? I got a good, I got a good answer for this. Can Go you? All right, cool. <laughs> um, so, the way I think about my games is I tend to come up with a moment first. Like, I come up with just what would be a really cool thing to happen in this game that would make my players say, whoa, like, uh, um, you know, something like the shovel knight, uh, like uh, bouncing off of an enemy with like a shovel sort of thing, just like some in, some really cool combination of mechanics that results in, a, in, in an interesting moment. And that's kind of the first thing I, vi- I visualize about a game is just like, what's, what's the moment where it comes alive for people? What's like a cool thing to show off? And... From that moment, I can kind of make a task list. Like, okay, if I, if I, if I'm making that shovel scenario, I'm going to need to make an enemy, and I'm going to need to make a character, and I'm going to need to make a, a shovel, and I'm going to need, need to make all these things. And that kind of becomes my to-do list for the project. And along the way, I'll probably discover a lot more because I'll be playing around, I'll be running around that blank room or whatever, and uh, I'll, I'll kind of come up with more moments. And I don't really work off of a design doc so much. Um, because I, I don't have to. Uh, no one, no one tells me what to do. <laughs> so uh, I, I can, I can just kind of do this sort of moment to moment kind of thing. And when I find the good moments, I can sort of pursue them. And towards the end of development, I, you know, kind of 
keep getting this like uh, zoomed out view of the whole project where I have all these interconnected moments and all these variations on these moments and all the way these moments interact. And it's really just making sure that's like a consistent sort of thing where there's a lot of like cool stuff happening and not a lot of, you know, just random uh, 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 gruel in between. Uh, but that's kind of how I, I, I plan out my games. Uh, it's very uh, fly by the city of your pants come up with something cool and try to get there. Um, I can try to answer that as well if you'd like, if you want more info. Um, so kind of that Venn diagram I was talking about where you find that intersection of what you want to make, what you can make, and what the market will support. So you can kind of take an analytical approach. If you start with the fun parts, you go, what, what parts do I enjoy the most, right? And you kind of trim your list down a bit there. And you can start by a category or a general concept, you know, keep it simple. And then... When you're looking at what the market will support, it's really good to be familiar with the market. So just spend a lot of time just looking at what's selling well on Steam, looking at games that are getting attention, stuff like that, and that'll give you a feel because this is like half art, half science sort of a thing. Um, the more you do that, the more familiar you'll be with it. For example, if you're like a horror movie junkie or you love reality TV or something, right? You, you know a good one or a bad one when you see it. You know a good idea or a bad idea when you hear it just because you're very familiar. So that helps a lot. That gives you that good gut instinct about what's going to work. And then from there, you can test it with a prototype or even just a simple pitch and or even an image. Um, one of the biggest games out there. Um, Lethal Company? Nope, not that one. Cutesy game. Cutesy game? Kind of like Pokemon. Oh, um, Power World, yeah. Nope. Nope, not Power World? Simpler. Simpler than Power World? <laughs> oh, Ooblets, I think oh, is what it's oh, called. Oh, yeah, Ooblets, the, so, the dance-off Pokemon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a little indie game, big success, super cute game. Started as literally just a GIF. So they were working on an entirely different project. They made this cute little art style. And they're like, you know, I, it's just a passion thing. Like, I really want to make this sort of thing and uh, put this thing out there. And I was like, oh, let's see if people are interested. That GIF went viral, caught enough attention that they decided to drop their whole game they were working on for a year and work on this one. It caught so much attention. And that's how big things can change. That's why I say put stuff out there early because then you'll know what sticks. You got to throw stuff against the wall to know. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of that whole process of half the art just being familiar and, and knowing what what works and what doesn't and then half the science just doing that research or that trial and error to see what works yeah um, how much do other viral games influence your process um not too much because Every game is unique to that person. Um, if you're chasing what's viral now, it's not going to be viral in two years or three years when you're done with the game. <laughs> um, you can do that. Like People build whole businesses around that strategy where whatever the hit game is, we're going to make a clone as fast as we can and be the next to market. That can work. Um, but if you want to make original creations and do your own thing, then you got to go for that. Um, when I'm in that beginning part and exploring ideas, I purposely try to avoid trying too many other ideas so that those original ones can come out of all of that. Because otherwise, you'll be more influenced by the most recent thing that you played. Um, and this happens all the time in, in studios as well. You know, Breath of the Wild came out. Everybody wanted to make Breath of the Wild. Next big game comes out. Everybody wants to make that. The idea is try to predict where things will be in three to five years and be up there. Make the next thing, not, not follow that wave. You can also kind of get, uh, I get a lot of my inspiration from old bad games, like games that tried something and failed and no one remembers. Uh, they're just a wealth of information, uh, both as learning opportunities, but also uh, you can, you have the benefit of having played many more games than the devs have, at, like, like modern games than the devs have at this point when you find it. So you can kind of maybe think of a good version of that bad game if it had that spark of creativity or something. Unicorn Overlord um, is, it takes a lot, uh, is, a, is a new strategy game, and it takes a lot of inspiration from uh, Ogre Battle 64, Person of Lordly Caliber, which is one of my favorite games of all time. I don't think anyone's played it. It, it was on like the N64 and the Wii U. 
and no one like people know maybe other like tactics ogre or ogre battle games but not so much person of lordly caliber but unicorn overlord kind of took that like put your uh, team comp together and do an auto battler type gameplay and you know with uh with, with vanilla wear signature style they're rocking it and people are like we want more games like this like why why did we stop making you know real-time strategies with auto battlers inside can we please do that can we please do more of that and do that again so i think uh, you, you, yeah, you be careful looking at what's viral because of that long dev cycle, but, uh, go back into weird old janky games and you can usually find a nugget of like creativity and gold, uh, that can really be like expanded on with, you know, modern game design thinking and resources. I just want to parrot that play bad games. Don't just play the good yes. ones. <laughs> you won't know a bad game if you don't play some bad games. So. Play, play, bad, play, play bad games and make bad games. Like, uh, make games and finish them, and uh, you'll, you know, you, you might not end up with your dream game. Um, sometimes it takes working on your dream game uh, to get you, like, passionate enough to, like, finish it. Uh, I started out making, like, what I thought would be an industry-rocking, like, incredible idea. I was going to be this, you know, Toby Fox-level genius game developer. And, then, and I, I kind of found out that I'm, I'm creative and I'm hardworking, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not an overnight sensation. And that's fine. Uh, I love making games, and I, I've been able to stay afloat and to have a pretty secure footing. So uh, I, I think... Um, yeah, I, I I think like make it just keep making games and make bad games and play bad games and play good games too. Like it's all it's all good experience and it's all gonna help you. Uh, have you ever played Azure Dreams for the PlayStation One? It's a it's a mystery dungeon style roguelike uh, with a dating sim element incorporated into it, uh, and it's. Um, it's it's devilishly difficult, uh, and uh, I was obsessed with it. I rented it from Blockbuck's, uh, Blockbuster, like every weekend back in back in the nineties. Uh, it's a Konami game. It uh, it's not. I don't think it's fun for like a modern person to play. But I I essentially tried to remake that. Uh, at, like that was a huge inspiration for me when I put my Steam game together. It's called Hack H A Q U E, and it's sort of a it's sort of a roguelike where you uh, have a you know you have a familiar friend, you have a monster that uh, follows you around, and you can kind of team up with the AI to fight. And that's very much what Azure Dreams is. I didn't I didn't pick up the dating sim element, um, and I think that's fine. No one really needs that in in my games. But I love I love dating sims. But uh, I, I I think maybe it's a a spicy choice to put in your very mechanics driven roguelike. What about you, Jed? Any bad games? Uh, no specific ones come to mind, but I think a better way maybe to put it is like, look at games and how can I improve it, right? Mm -hmm. Find bad ones, find things with bad reviews, look at the specific things that you can improve on. That's kind of the goal of like play the bad games is how could this be improved? You know, how could I change something about it? Um, and I, I just wanted to piggyback on what Kevin was saying too about like, it doesn't have to be an overnight success. It doesn't have to be a huge game. Um, there's a company you can look up. It's called Spiderweb Software, and they've been making the same types of old school RPG games for years and years and years. Every one of them is just this, you know, a moderate little bit of a success. They have their market, they have a niche, and they keep finding success with that over and over by delivering it to the same slowly growing audience. But they just do what they love, and they found their niche. That is a completely valid way to go, as long as you're just doing what you love. So that sounds a lot like From Software's story, how they were making Kingsfield games and Armored Core for a very niche audience of super nerds for a very long time. And I remember reading like the Kingsfield reviews, and they're like, "This game is awful. Like the skeleton, even the skeletons look bored. Like this is, this is such a, a, a chore to work through." And eventually, they kicked out Dark Souls, and you know, completely like changed, yeah, changed the industry, changed uh, what people thought of them, and. But I, I think, yeah, there's, you know, maybe they didn't have to make so many Kingsfield games, but uh, I, I think serving a quality audience can beat serving a quantity audience. Like, it, I, it can be more reliable and stable to just have a personal relationship with a few people who are as freaky as you are with your game taste and choices, rather than try and constantly chase, uh, like, viral success.
just adding on to that like bad games point, I've actually had that an idea to try that with specifically the game Sword of Vermilion, which was like a Sega Genesis RPG that basically tried to combine like a standard top-down JRPG with a first-person dungeon, cra dungeon crawler and an action RPG. Whoa. And it's really cool conceptually, but they ruined it because it's unpolished and <laughs> controls terribly. But I think that that concept has potential. Yeah. That, that's a really good place to start. Start with something that bombed but had a good idea and go for it or take a very very simple game idea and go how could i make this better we sound like vultures right now <laughs> we sound like pick off the corpse yeah, of those that died there. <laughs> uh, you in the back um i was wondering how much marketing goes into the actual game design part of it and um do you think about specifically like will this be fun to watch on youtube or twitch or something and if you're talking to like a publisher is that part of that, that's per developer. When I do it, I, that's very much part of the strategy from the beginning is try to make something that is very influencer friendly um, because I'm making these kind of goofy games that fit that market. But if I was making something like a, a strategy game or something like that, um, I don't think I would take that approach because it's not something as fun to watch as it is to play. So you just say you, you have to adjust it based off your genre, I think. Uh, marketing is extremely painful for me. So uh, I kind of had to figure out a way to make it fun for myself. Uh, I uh, started uh, editing podcasts and eventually I started being on podcasts and putting myself out, out there like that has kind of allowed me some, you know, uh, advertisement slots at the end of these podcasts I do uh, where I can just be like, hey, and if you like listening to my funny voice, you know, maybe you like playing my, vi my video games or uh, play my tabletop RPG. I think there's a lot of ways you can do marketing. Um, if, you're a, if you're a solo dev like me, like you can kind of just make up your own rules. I try, again, I try for that audience, uh, like quality over audience quantity type thing. Um, I've never worked with a publisher, but uh, I, I do kind of work with uh, folks who like either buy a license for my game or, or contracts or stuff. So there's, there are ways to make money in games that aren't just game sales. Um, you can... Uh, you, you can sell your work contract style. You can uh, license out your stuff. I make a couple educational games uh, that have been licensed by Cool Math Games. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows them, but uh, they're they're great and and they pay me uh, for my video games. Uh, and it, it, it's a it, it was a cool way of uh, kind of making ends meet uh, for a while. So. Um, yeah, there's lots of ways to make money on games. Uh, if you hate doing marketing, there might be some way more personable you can figure it out, but it's really kind of hard to lay down a specific roadmap for that. Yeah, if, if you don't like marketing, outsource it. Like, get a publishing partner or get a PR firm. Um, I've known games that were very successful. Um, one in particular comes to mind, but I can't think of the name. Very niche audience where you're basically just exploring a peaceful world. There are no enemies. There's no big goals, really, except you're going around and getting paintings of stuff. And uh, fits a certain type of, of audience, certain type of people that love that game. But uh, they're like, we don't know business. We don't know marketing. And we don't want to do it. We're doing this because we love it. So they're going off savings, building this game over the course of four years, I believe. And they just hired a PR company. They're like, we'll just hire a PR company. And they said it worked very, very well for them. So if you're not good at it or you don't like doing it, outsource it, partner with somebody, and, and do your research on them. And if you're very low budget like me, just try to make it fun, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just, just make it silly enough that you don't mind doing it. And yeah, but yeah, seriously, I, 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 once I can, a PR company sounds awesome. <laughs> If um, also like YouTubers and stuff, if you find somebody that's into the kind of game that you're making, don't be afraid to reach out to them. Um, you can find their emails in lots of different places, you know, on their YouTube channel. Sometimes they share it. Sometimes you can just ping them. Um, but don't be afraid to reach out and start small. Start with whoever will do it because they constantly need content. They constantly want something new to share and they want to be the first one to share it. So you're a valuable asset to them. So go into it with that confidence like, hey, I've got something good for you. Um, kick it right off with a very short, fast loading GIF or a cool screenshot, something that's going to capture their attention right away and prompt them to reply to you. Um, I don't know how many times I've got an email back saying, I don't usually reply to these, but that GIF was so awesome, I feel like I have to. You know, that's the kind of reaction you want. Make it worth people's time, and then they'll, they'll do the same. Is that a big part of your success with Jets and Glory? 
Yeah, I reached out to YouTubers all over the world. Um, I just sent emails, um, commented on people's videos. Anywhere people would listen, I put it out there, and it took off in the weirdest places. Like, it took off in, uh, like, Portugal or Brazil or something like that. Um, and it turned out it was, like, one of the biggest YouTubers in that particular area was playing it. Um, couldn't understand what he was telling me or anything. Couldn't understand the video, but it was awesome, and it was getting a bunch of attention. So I just, you know, said thank you the best way I could, and and it took off from there. That's so cool. Yeah, I, I've, I've found, like, people from, uh, like, all of the world, like, will... I'll see, like, a spike in, like, my, uh, my analytics, and I'll be like, why are a bunch of people from Japan playing my game? And there's just, like, a Japanese YouTuber who does browser-based, like, semi-educational games, and he's got a loyal fan base, and uh, he, he played my game, and they liked it. And I'm like, cool. Uh, I, I think if you're also trying to go... Uh, if you're looking for that global, like, international success... Um, uh, like I've, I've heard the argument that it's probably more worth it to hire a Spanish translator than to port something to Mac. You'll get more users if you, if you keep it just on PC, but add Spanish. <laughs> so, uh, if you're trying to increase like the amount of people that your game is available to localizing is pretty good, but if you can try and make a game that you don't have to localize, try to make a game with as little text as possible. There's a game out uh, from a Japanese developer called a Leckhead, which is this awesome little puzzle platformer, um, did pretty well too. And, uh, there's no text in the game. He does it all with like symbol language. I think the only text is the title of the game, a Leckhead. Everything else is all symbol language in the menus and everything. And it's really cool. It's really slick looking. Yeah, look at Nintendo the next time you play a Nintendo game. They do a lot of that. They try to minimize their localization. And I think a lot of Japanese companies realize, like, if I want to sell this in bigger parts of the world, we need to not rely too much on keeping it just Japanese. So works well to do that. It cuts your cost down, makes it simpler. Yeah, if that works for your game, if you're trying to make a more text-based game, you know, maybe hire a Spanish translator. Don't, don't trust the Google Translate yeah. or anything like that. One good tip about using influencers and marketing too is realize that it's actually a different market. A lot of people that watch YouTube videos aren't the actual gamers that probably are going to buy it. They like to watch games. Um, so realize that it's a different audience. It helps bring the exposure and it helps get it out there. And then that word of mouth spreads to the people that actually buy it and be like, Oh, I heard that game's awesome. Or I watched my favorite YouTuber play it. Um, go buy it. So that's kind of how that translates, but know that a lot of people that watch YouTubers, uh, especially religiously, aren't usually the gamers that actually play them. They just like watching them. Yeah, and I would apply that uh, similarly to if you're trying to like do your own influencing, if you're trying to like maybe show your process and stuff, and like uh, parlay your game design skills into like a game design channel on YouTube or uh, on TikTok or whatever. Uh, be careful. Uh, game devs are broke and we don't have time to play video games. So if you're appealing like directly to other game devs, um, I, you, you, you may, you may be in a little bit of trouble when it comes time to sell because other game devs are notoriously bad at finding time to play other people's games. Uh, so just a little, 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 little caveat, little warning there. Any other questions? All right. Oh, yeah. Uh, what part of the game design process do you find most difficult? Again, marketing is so painful and scary. Game design. Probably. Oh, game design. Pro oh, phew. Okay. Um, <laughs> part of the game design process I find painful and scary. I love the game design process. Um, I'm. I don't know, Jed. Do you have anything that it's you really don't the like? Feature doing? creep. <laughs> like saying no to your own ideas and trying to decide uh, between A, B, and C, which one are people going to love the most. So uh, easiest way to alleviate that, though, is just get in people's hands, let them try it and see. Um, but it's not always possible because sometimes you got to build the whole thing first to know. <laughs> so that's the hardest part is just keeping your ideas contained. So you got to really be aggressive about keeping feature creep at bay. Um, and then killing your darlings is another one. I don't know if anybody's heard that phrase. Yeah. Um, if you're making a show or a book or movie, you might have a favorite character or an idea or something. You got to be not afraid to kill your darlings, which means if this idea is not working, be able to recognize it, be able to let it go, because there's a better one waiting around the corner. You got to make room for it. Uh, thinking about it, level design is really hard. Level design 
is uh, such an iter- iter- iterative, iterative process where you're constantly uh, trying to basically like form sentences in an essay and like <laughs> presenting like information that will come up later and like trying to have a logical stream of thought through a bunch of different levels that teach you in in some games and in, in kind of the more puzzly games I do. That's where a lot of my stress lies because you know I'll. I'll Make a, I'll make a level with like this kind of obtuse path in it, and I'll put it in front of playtesters, and they'll get completely lost. And I'll be like, oh, but I made so, I put yellow paint on everything. Like I made it as obvious as I could. But it's always just sort of this back and forth of like trying to say something, trying to get those moments to shine, and uh, trying to be empathetic and understanding to a playtester who's only been in front of the game for five minutes, not years like you have been. So it, that that part can be scary uh, as far as uh, game game design yeah. goes just level yeah. design is watching other people play your game can be painful oh my god i can't <laughs> <laughs> i try to i try to like show up on twitch streams when they play my games and like be like hey thanks thanks so so, so much for doing it uh th- thank you but yeah especially i remember when i launched my game on steam uh in the in like the 1.0 version there was a bug where if you hit t on the keyboard the whole game would crash and uh, they were like, I can't figure out why it's doing it. And like, I just like checked. I'm like, I wonder if it's this one line of code. And it was. And I'm like, uh, yeah, um, it'll it'll be fixed tomorrow. <laughs> just don't press T. Yeah, teaching or part of game design is teaching. Like you have to teach them the mechanics, help them learn to play, help them the ru- learn the rules. So it's kind of like teaching someone to ride a bike, but also say, but also do this jump and make a trick and you get some points. So it can be really tricky. So some of it you can just borrow from already known designs. So if you already know how to ride a bike, it's going to be easier to know how to play this little game I've made and there's less to teach. But I think that's one of the most challenging parts of game design is helping players learn new concepts or mechanics. I've had ones where I literally would put a, a sign that you had to drive through right in front of the player and they wouldn't, they would die 10 times in a row before they finally stopped to read the sign and go, oh, that's how I get past this point. So <laughs> no matter what you do, it's, it's always the, a really hard part is teaching during game design. I mean, I think that's a very human thing because uh, yesterday I was trying to get into my hotel and I was just pressed up against a door that said not an entrance trying to be like why why can't I enter uh, I think ignoring signs is a very big part of the human condition but it, it is this kind of difficult tightrope you have to walk where people don't people want to feel like they're respected as you're teaching them something about how your game works so you want it you want it to feel like they're figuring the thing out unless like you are directly telling them so especially with like you know, main mechanics, like the, t- the tutorial never really ends. You're always just kind of gently guiding players in the right direction. The, the only thing that really changes is how gently you do it in the beginning, you know, you can give them, you know, enough to figure it out, but just like figuring out how heavy or how gentle to be with that so that they feel like their intelligence is respected. They feel like that they can solve this problem. They feel, and they don't feel discouraged by, you know, uh, you throwing up little goblin like roadblocks in front of them. But, uh, also, you know, just, yeah, keeping that relationship between the, the player and the designer in mind at all times. So you're trying to be the good teacher, not the mean teacher. Yeah. Guiding more than telling. Yeah. yeah. All right, got enough time for one or two more questions? You got 10 minutes. Oh, wow. All right. Uh, Anybody got anything else? Yeah, go for it. So on the flip side, what part of the game design process do you enjoy the most? Ooh. Oh. Prototyping. I just love <laughs> coming up with silly ideas and making them, making them happen, so. That's the funnest part. Yeah, uh, prototyping is super fun. I, in 2020, I did uh, 12 games in one year. Just did a, a jam or a prototype every single month, and uh, it was a lot of work. And uh, I, I don't, uh, I don't think I could do that every year of my life. Uh, but yeah, just like coming up with new stuff is it, it, just that immediate reward. Games could. could 
Yeah, games come together like really fast in the beginning, and then there's this huge swamp in the yep. middle where you're just like where most games go to die. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> the swamp of sadness. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Everything kind of sinks down. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm doing right now is I'm working on a longer form game again after many years just making short form games. And uh, I had to talk to my patrons because they were funding me based on like my shorter form stuff. And I was like, hey, I kind of want to get into some big, long projects, but the middle of it isn't going to be so exciting. Like, It's not going to be like, here's a new mechanic or here's a new thing. It's going to be like, look, the pixels are square now. They were kind of like rectangular because of like stretching, but like I figured out textures and stuff. No, no, like, that's the kind of boring day-to-day -day, like maintenance and and feature and like minor feature stuff that nobody thinks about but you know when when you have all that when when you play a truly bad game that's like unfinished and uh not ready for like the general player base you start to see these little like conveniences and niceties disappear all over the place and you know making a full complete game that you know, you're you're comfortable putting a price tag on and selling and uh, putting your name on and all that. Like that takes a really long amount of time and a lot of iterating and a lot of work. Uh, and a lot of that work is boring uh, and and slow. But uh, and so I was worried because like you know my prototypes were so exciting, like making twelve games in a year, like every month a new game. Wow, that's really cool. And you know it was fun for me too. But you, I I just had this idea for a longer form game. So I had to go to my patrons and be like, Hey, I want to make a long game and it's going to be boring. And they were all like, yeah, cool. Sounds great. Nobody dropped. Nobody was mad at me. Um, I do like a weekly blog where I tell them about the boring stuff. And a lot of people seem to appreciate the insight. So yeah, that's, uh, that's another point towards having a quality audience over a quantity audience, people who support you and, and finishing the game. Like anybody yeah. new to games, um, that's, you'll probably hear that a lot is make something you finish like just finish the game because uh, most game projects don't get finished. They start with a fun idea and it's really fun at first and then the real work begins and it kind of becomes a slog. So come up with a game idea, chop it in half, make it simpler. And then when you think it's as simplified as you can go simpler <laughs> and then finish it. Um, and that's a, that's, a process, so part of a process that I started doing recently, um, it's called, well, it doesn't really have an official name, but I call it the skateboard method. And you picture a game as like a car, right? That's your finished project. The, the customer, your player, they want a car to drive. But building a car takes forever, so you start with a board and four wheels. You start with a skateboard. Make the simplest version of your idea you can first from start to finish can be basic placeholder graphics, basic stuff, but just get that game loop in there and see if that's fun by itself with basics. Then make that, you know, make it a scooter, make it a little bit better, add another feature before you know it, you got your car and then you're super happy. That's how you can do that demo or die concept. That's how you can get stuff in players' hands ASAP. Um, so a game doesn't have to take forever. Don't make the mistake many devs do of trying to focus too much on the graphics from the beginning or one big level or concept, like boil it down to its bare minimum parts and that should be fun by itself. And then, you know, you're building on top of a solid foundation. Yeah. And that's great advice for whether you're doing a, a tiny game, like a, a game jam project or a, a massive multi-year project, just making sure you have that minimum viable product as soon as possible, making sure, you know, it's got a beginning and an ending and if possible, a middle, but uh, yeah, one thing I had to kind of get over really fast was I would make my, I would make my games like in order. Like I'd make like I'd make the the first part of the game, and then I'd be like there'd be some sort of nebulous finish that I'd be working towards, and I'd just be trying to get like through the game development process in the order it would be played. And that's dumb. Just like make the beginning, make the end, and then with whatever time you have left, make the middle. Just keep building it out. And you'll have something finished that people can play. That, that's funny. I take the little bit opposite and I start with the middle. Really? Um, yeah, start with that core game loop, whatever you're going to be doing second to second, and then figure out how you want to introduce players to it and how you want to wrap it up. Yeah, I find different approaches. Yeah, different approaches that may, make sense to me. But, like, <laughs> yeah. So when you do have a long game project that you're working on, do you still go back, like, take a day or two? Like, do you have a mechanic in mind? And, like, do you just go do that and maybe just put it in your library of stuff? Like, oh, maybe this will be or do you just focus on that one game so you don't get lost? 
I get lost constantly. Um, but we all have ADHD it's game, true. game developers. <laughs> it's very, very true. Yeah, I can't really stop myself from making new mechanics. So uh, if it's so, if it's such a huge mechanic that like. I'll have to completely like change massive parts of my game. That might be a next time sort of thing. But uh, if if it's like good and it's simple and like it um, it, it elevates the project, then yeah, I'll I'll go back and and reincorporate it and move some stuff around. But uh, yeah, it, you know, it's hard it's hard to like again the future creep. It's hard to beat that back and or project creep or project creep. Um, but yeah, especially for me, because I just kind of follow my heart when I make games and I don't really have so much of a design document, it, I kind of have to remind myself constantly that, okay, buddy, you're making too many mechanics and I know you don't want to eat your vegetables and do level design, but no one's just going to play a game that's only mechanics in a blank room. You got to actually make some levels and, and build out the actual game. So that's kind of that's <laughs> where I run into trouble. And there's two approaches to like there's art or business looking at games too. Um, like what Kevin does very much like art, like he's creating art, he's creating stuff from the heart, just creating these raw things. And, um, there's another developer that does that very successfully named Zalavier Nelson. Um, and he produces a lot of games and he looks at them very much as art. They have small budgets for a game, like a million dollars. He's looking to only, you know, make modest profits on things. And he may, he builds small games very quickly, but he treats them like art. Um, I try to find a balance between, I just do what I'm passionate about and explore those ideas. But then I try to take that business analytics look and try to create a business from it as well. So you can take totally different approaches and either one's viable, whatever your goals may be. Yeah. I would like to point out that you have a wife and children <laughs> and you have, yeah. your, your, uh, your business acumen is, is, uh, is like you got, you gotta be supportive. You got You have a, you have people to support and I'm just kind of this like free spirit guy who doesn't really have a whole lot of connections. So, uh, I, I think, it's not like a art is good, business is bad sort of thing. It's uh, you you know you do what you can to make you, to make to create stuff and to constantly make stuff and to make things as secure for yourself and the people you you love as possible. And sometimes that pulls you in an art direction, and sometimes that pulls you in a business direction. Like you're a creative person, you you make you make amazing stuff and beautiful art. Like, uh, and on occasion I have to do a business, so it's. <laughs> It, 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 no one's truly in game dev. No one can truly be like pure art or pure business. If you if you make a game and don't release it, I guess that's no business at all. But uh, yeah, you know, it, it's it's uh, everybody chooses their own like uh, combination of art and business when they get into game dev. Yeah, I, I'd be happy making games in a van down by the river, but I don't think my family would be too happy with that. <laughs> so, but definitely do it for the passion, do what you love doing, and uh, put a, enough business sense behind it as you go. Again, that 80 20 rule will help you a lot and get you where you need to go. Yeah. What's up? How do you avoid, uh, like, losing interest in your project? Tying it to your income is a good way to <laughs> make sure that you finish it. Um, but I think social pressure also helps me a lot. Like I tell, I try to like reveal, you know, my process to my friends and to the people who follow me online and uh, especially to the people who give me money. And I try to make sure that I'm, you know, I'm talking about what I'm doing so that people can be like, hey, whatever happened to that game? Because I'll feel like really bad if I'm like, oh, I, I abandoned it. So I kind of leverage my own social anxiety, I guess. Uh, to make sure I, I finish my projects. Um, so just, yeah, tell people about it, get people excited for it. And, you know, think I, I think about who's going to play my game eventually. Like I think about the, the folks who will eventually play my game and I, I kind of tend to make it for them and a little less for me as the project goes on. That, that's my biggest motivator is like picturing who's going to play the game, who I'm making the game for and not letting them down. So when I want to, see them happy, make them something fun. That's what motivates me and keeps me going. Um, but I also keep in mind Einstein's quote of, it's like, what is it? Uh, it's like 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. <laughs> so you do, it just has, uh, it takes a lot of discipline as well. The bigger the project, the more discipline, because no matter how excited you are at the beginning, that novelty will, will wear off and you'll have to like power through building what you're going to build. Um, fighting through bugs and, 
you know, figuring out your marketing and stuff like that. So it is a lot of work that goes into it too. And a lot of that's just, just discipline and willpower um, and thinking about who you're making it for. Yeah. The sad truth is at the end of making your game, you probably will be a little less excited to play it. <laughs> You've been playing it for a very long time and in the most unfun way possible. <laughs> uh, you'll be able to stand next to it and be proud of it. And in a few years, you can rediscover it as if, you know, the past you made it and then not the now you. Uh, but you want to I think you want to be looking forward to who you're going to put this game in front of, like what your friends are going to think, what your audience is going to think. And think about that in terms of actual people, like like the actual people in your life, and less in terms of like I want to get high ratings or I want to like uh, like get whoever to play it. Just like yeah, th think of your friends, think of the people in your life uh, that you want to impress with it. Have fun and get stuff done. <laughs> All right. Well, I think I that's think probably that's a wrap. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Um, it's good talking with y'all. I love talking about games anytime. So feel free to hit me up. I'm on most of the different socials and stuff. So free to chat about games anytime or offer advice where I can. Yeah. And we're both in the big room with tables. Uh, so if you want to come say hi, please do. And thank you for showing up. It means a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm Kevin and that's Judd. Thanks, guys. Thank you.